Well, good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome and greetings to everyone wherever you are this morning, uh, listening in and participating in, in the way we can this morning. And even though it's not the way we would wish for, we give God praise and glory, and we are so thankful that we're able to worship God wherever and whenever. And God invites us to approach His throne of grace with confidence because of what He has done for us. And that's what we're doing here this morning. We can do it individually anytime, and we can do it in a format like this as well. And we give praise to God for that. So before we continue here, um, I, I'm noticing that a few of you are, uh, you know, quite casual. PJs? Really? I'm not sure how appropriate your PJs are for the service here this morning. So you know who I'm talking to. Yeah, you right there. Go ahead and just pause the service and go get dressed appropriately. Yeah, go ahead. See, there you go. We can even have a little bit of fun. I bet you didn't see that coming. Our call to worship verse for today comes from Psalm 105, verse 1, and it says, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim His name, make known among the nations what He has done. Let me pray with all of us. Father, as we meet, wherever we are, in our homes, uh, gathering maybe with some family or friends, Father, we just give you praise and we thank you, Father, that we can still meet and we can still be a community because it's not the building or walls that holds us together. It's our faith in you. And we are a, a faith family, a community of faith. And community is what binds us together through Jesus and in Jesus. So we thank you for this platform and this format and this opportunity. We pray that you would still be glorified through this. We pray that every single one participating and listening would be encouraged. And that they would uh, feel a blessing. And that they would just really uh, be blessed through this service. We thank you, Father. We pray that you would lead and guide this service. We pray uh, that you would be glorified through it. Amen. So at this time, I want to encourage all of you to uh, pause uh, this recording and to actually, uh, as a family, pick some songs to sing together. Have a time of worship and song. You can sing your favorite hymns. Uh, maybe you have a few favorite choruses that you know off by heart. You could go on YouTube and pick a few songs and sing along as somebody on YouTube leads it. See, even in this format, we all get to pick the songs that we want. So this morning, there can be should be no disappointments. You all get the song you want at the volume you want. Isn't that cool? There you go. So I would encourage you to do that at this time. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad uh, you're all... Uh in your homes, keeping safe, but at uh, this time we'll go over the uh, announcements, so if you want to follow along. Uh, next service at the church, there will, be, there will be no service at the church next Sunday on the 29th. All regularly scheduled programs are on hold for now. Coming up this week, next on prayer meeting, Thursday at 7 p.m. in your homes. Faith story next Sunday. If someone comes forward, please talk to Pastor Abe as soon as possible. And coming up, the church cleaning, April 14th. Please come out to help with, your, with our annual church cleaning day. Uh, Reddit Cup Ministries will be canceled at this time until further notice. Palm Sunday service, April 5th at Mount Salem Community Church at 7 p.m. This is an Elmer and Area Community Joint Service put on by the Elmer Ministerial. This is a great event showing your, our unity, unity in Christ as area churches. Uh, baptism, April 19th. And the other items there, I will just highlight a uh, few things there. As we are all aware at this time, COVID-19 uh, happening, uh, we want to take appropriate measures to ensure everyone's safety. Uh, if the current circumstances change or get extended, we will reevaluate our next step at this time. And the uh, e-transfer, again, given the circumstances, now we are promoting an e-transfer donation, so if you feel led or the Lord uh, is uh, empowering you to give in this way, please feel free to do, to do so. You can do that at the uh, Strafferville EMC uh, email. It's uh, semcgiving at gmail.com. Again, that's semcgiving at gmail.com, all lowercase. And moving on to the praise and prayer, 
Uh, praise God that Jesus is still on the throne. Praise God that we have the freedom to worship wherever we are. Pray for the COVID-19 victims, the health organizations and governments. Pray for healing. Pray for wisdom for the government and churches. Pray for those who are struggling with anxiety over work, finances, loved ones, or loneliness. And pray that we would all allow the light of Jesus to shine through us. Thank you, Henry, for that. We would encourage you at this time to pause this audio recording and to, with your group or with your family, to spend some time praying for the things that are in the bulletin under the praise and prayer items that Henry just read for us. At this time, uh, we will go to our Lent experience video for the week and where we'll hear our challenge for the week. So you can either listen to the audio version of it right here or you can pause right now, and if you have access to Right Now Media, you can go and watch the Lent Challenge video there. Thank you. Almsgiving. It's an old school word. Some words or phrases like it are charity, compassion, good deeds, helping the poor. Psalm 11.7 talks about our, quote, righteous deeds. And Deuteronomy 15 describes open-handed living. Both the Old and New Testaments are loaded with the importance of caring for others, especially those in need. Your participant journal this week will give you a good look at just how prevalent this theme is in the entirety of the scriptures. Proverbs 14.31 Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Proverbs 19.17 Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Being kind and gracious to others is motivated by the fact that God has been kind and gracious to us. Now, I obviously don't know the current financial status and life situation of each person who's participating in the Lent experience. What I do know is that one of the things that followers of Jesus embrace is generosity. And it's something that moves from just a thought or sentiment into real life practical expression of genuine care for others in big ways, but more frequently in small ways. When we are caring for the needs of others, we are expressing how God created us to be in the first place. You know, before sin messed everything up. When you read the account of creation in Genesis, you quickly notice that humans are different than the rest of God's creation. Human beings are the pinnacle of his creation because it says that we are made, quote, in his image. Now, we can have a good conversation about what it means to be made in God's image, but one of the things we know for sure from the creation account is that God gave people the responsibility to care for what he had made. That includes each other because we are part of God's creation. So it's not a stretch to say that when I'm caring for another person, I'm doing what I was created to do. Almsgiving is real world stuff. It reminds us how good God has been to us, that we are created in God's image, which to some extent means we were given responsibility. And it reminds us, hopefully without unnecessary guilt or condemnation, but with the correct amount of honesty and humility, that the selfishness of sin has a way of pulling us away from the kind of life that we were all created to live. So, this week's challenge is simple, but not as straightforward as other weeks. You'll need to do a little creative thinking to pull this one off. Your challenge is to do one thing this week to care for someone in need. This challenge, regardless of how you end up completing it, will force you to look beyond yourself in a good way. I'm going to avoid the temptation here to over-explain this. Your participant journal will give you some direction and some things to think about if you get stuck. I'll simply ask you to pray this simple prayer with me right now. Let's pray together. God, please help me to identify who you want me to help this week and what you want me to do. Amen. That's it. This is going to be a good week. I'll see you next Sunday. What a timely challenge, given our circumstances. May we together take up this challenge and be encouraged and grow as a result of it.
About four weeks ago, we introduced a new vision statement for Straffordville EMC. That new vision statement is live, reach, gather, and teach with Jesus as Lord. Over the last three weeks, we've been looking at the definitions for each word, and today we want to look at the last word, teach, and look at the definition of that. So as a recap, we looked at the definitions for live, reach, and gather. We said, live courageously under the Lordship of Jesus. Reach others near and far with the love of Jesus. Gather for fellowship, service, and worship of King Jesus. And so today we want to look at the word teach. And the short definition is teach obedience from a Christ-centered approach to Scripture. So we just want to take a few minutes now to unpack that a little bit. The mission of the church is to point people to Jesus and to teach them to follow him in obedience. Acts 2 verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The early church, right after Pentecost, uh, there was a bunch of new believers, and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Well, what did the apostles teach them? Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 17, and we find here that the Apostle Paul was teaching young Timothy to continue in what he had been taught about the Holy Scriptures. And this ties into what the Apostles were teaching in Acts. And it says there, But as for you, talking to Timothy from Paul, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the teachings that the apostles taught was the Holy Scriptures. It was the teachings that they saw from Jesus himself. And Jesus himself, uh, as they as he walked this earth and walked with the apostles, he quoted Old Testament and explained it. And in many ways, he was the fulfillment of many of the scriptures that he quoted. But we must never forget what the scriptures are and what they point to. They are God's story. They are his story, history of redeeming God's story, of redeeming mankind through Jesus. All scripture somehow is part of telling that story. Therefore, we believe that all of scripture must be viewed through the lens of Jesus, which is why the author of Hebrews says what he did in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where it says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but... In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So the author of Hebrews here is enlightening us and showing us that Jesus is the fulfillment of all things. If scriptures were for the purpose of God revealing himself and of telling his story of how he's going to redeem his people, and if here we're told that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that, if he is the one that is the exact representation of who God is, and we know that Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate, the Son of God. So it's through Jesus and th- that we understand the biblical story. So we look through the lens of Christ as we read scripture and we recognize our need to obey it and to follow Jesus. Um, And it's done in Jesus and we do that with joy as his followers because of what he did for us. At this time, we're going to move to the scripture. The scripture reading for today prior to the sermon, Luke chapter 17 verses 11 through 19. I would encourage you at this time to pause the recording and to, with your family, to open the Bible to this passage, and a few of you read the passage together before you listen to the sermon. And so let me now pray. Henry Thiessen is bringing the message this morning, and he's called it, Be Thankful. So let me pray for Henry. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your servant, Henry. We thank you for his willingness uh, to study your word and to be used by you. So, Father, we just pray that you would anoint him with your spirit right now, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us through him uh, as he looks into your word. Would you bless him, give him calmness and peace, and would you speak to us through him? In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. I hope you're all doing good. I'm glad you've invited me into your home in this way. I know this is not uh, what we are used to, but given the circumstances, well, I pray that the Lord's blessing on you in this way. A story is told of a man lost in the woods. Later in describing the experience, he told how frightened he was and how he had even finally knelt and prayed. Someone asked, did, you, did God answer your prayer? Oh no, the man replied. Before God had a chance, a guide came along and showed me the way out. Are we like the man in this story, going through life, not seeing the blessing God gives us as we go through life? In this morning's text out of Luke chapter 17, verse 11 through 19, we read of a man who receives a miraculous blessing. Let's all see what we can learn from this man. If you have your Bibles, open it to uh, Luke chapter 17 starting at verse 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God, In a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. In today's text, it talks about how ten men were cleansed of leprosy, but only one returned to give thanks. Let's read again, starting at verse 11 through 13. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where if we read the rest of Luke, we see that Jerusalem is the place where he will meet his appointed destiny. Now it doesn't mention the name of the village he is in, But that is not what is important. What is important here is what he is doing there. And then it goes on to say, As he enters the village, ten men with leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So why were they standing at a distance? Why didn't they just run up to Jesus and ask to be healed? Because Jewish law at the time was very strict about people with leprosy. I won't go into detail about, about it all, but I will mention a few key things. First, they had to leave where they lived and go out of the town and be by themselves or with other, other lepers, as it was in this case. And uh, we can read about it in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45 and verse 46, where it mentions how they are to deal with lepers. Leviticus 13, 45 and 46 says, Anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, Unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. So here we see how it describes how these leprous men or people are to live if they have been diagnosed with this terrible disease. And also it says if somebody passes by, they are to call out unclean, unclean. This is to inform anybody passing by of their disease. But if we read through Leviticus too, it describes this horrific disease in great detail. I can't imagine how these men must have felt being completely cast out of their community, their family, 
their church family, everybody, they were basically shunned from society. I don't know, it's just, just so hard to believe that that's the extent that they would have to go through just to, to keep this from spreading. And it talks about how they are to go, or excuse me, in Leviticus it talks about how they are to go to a priest, and only a priest could reintroduce them back with society after a long ritual. The Lord gave Moses these instructions in Leviticus chapter 14. And there again, it describes in great detail of what this ritual actually all entails. It's not a very simple thing that they can just go and do, you know, a five or ten minute uh, blessing and a prayer over these, these men or, you know, uh, one at a time. But it's quite intense what they have to go through. So if you're ever uh, interested in that, I, I would uh, encourage you to take time and read over that. It's, it's actually quite interesting. And I know in today's modern world, we live in quite different world than they do. You know, it's quite a bit easier if we are diagnosed with, with an illness. We can just go to the doctor and uh, if, if it is something simple, we can be in and out of there, you know, within, uh, within an hour, you know, if uh, the wait time is not too long. I know sometimes we end up sitting in the, in the waiting room for, for quite some time, but, you know, if we are there for, uh, for a valid reason, we will get seen and we will get treated. So it, it's quite different today than it had been at that time. So again, these men were completely abandoned by society left to fend for themselves, abandoned by their family, friends, everybody. Who knows, maybe they lived in caves, maybe they made a makeshift home for themselves, just some basic shelter, basic necessities, and I don't imagine that uh, they had a whole lot of nutritious food. They would have to go and, and, uh, and hunt, gather whatever they could Find to, to find nourishment to survive. But as these men, they must have felt so lonely out there, being by themselves in a small group. Again, it's just thinking about it, it, uh, it, it makes my heart sad of what they had to go through. But the times they live in, that's what the law required, so that's what, what they had to do. But loneliness can be a, a hard thing to deal with. I know uh, the situation we're in now, we are asked to stay home, we are asked to distance ourselves from other people, and even that is very hard because that's not what we're used to. We're used to being around other people, socializing, doing various things, even going to work. A lot of people can't go to work, so loneliness can set in, it can really play tricks on your mind, but I encourage all of us during this time to just rely on God for your strength, support one another through, through uh, social media, call each other, whatever you feel is, uh, is safe to do so, I would encourage you to do that. But often at times we feel too that God has abandoned us. God doesn't abandon us. We may feel that he does. We feel at times that he is nowhere in our lives, He's not there. Why isn't he helping us? But, again, I wanted to encourage you to know that God is always there. Whether you feel it or not, he is always there. But again, feeling that way is not right, I know, but that's human nature. It's our feelings. They can play tricks on us. We feel that God has abandoned us. We feel that we have done something so bad that God will not forgive us. And maybe we need to cry out to God like these men. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. So continuing in our text, chapter, or excuse me, verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Go show yourselves to the priests. Why would they need to do this? Because Jewish law required you to go to the priests and carry out an extensive ritual of cleansing before the good could be accepted back into the religious community and worship, like it says again in Leviticus chapter 14. And then as they went, they were cleansed. 
Continuing on, it says in verse 15 through 16, And one of them, when he saw was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. So out of these ten, only one came back to thank Jesus. Maybe the other nine were so overcome with joy and excitement, they, were, they just wanted to go home, that they forgot to come back and thank Jesus. They wanted to go home, back to their family, back to their normal life, go to work. They must have been so overjoyed that they were healed. And I find it interesting that the writer points out here that the one that came back was a Samaritan. This guy was a Samaritan, implying the rest were Jewish. He is the last guy you would think would receive healing, especially in Jewish eyes. But the only one who truly has faith is this Samaritan. And Jesus expresses his sadness and disappointment. Where are the other nine, he asks. Jesus has done a great thing here. Ten men were cleansed, but only one came back. How did these other ones not see what just happened here? Again, maybe they were so excited that they just wanted to go home. I don't know. But I wonder if he looks out at our church. I wonder if he looks out at our church and asks the same question. Where are the ones I restored? Where are the ones I've saved? Where are the ones I gave gifts? Where are the thankful? Why is it when things are going good? God is the furthest thing from our minds. We tend to think it's because of our own efforts that we are living a good life. And when hard times come, we are quick to blame God. Why is that? I know for myself, I would have to put myself at the top of this list because I find myself doing this more than I'd like to confess to, but I do. I said, if things are going well, I don't take time to thank God for what he's doing in my life, how he is working in my life, and giving me the very breath that I breathe. Because without God, not even that is possible. But then again, as soon as something goes wrong, I want God to come and help me. God, come and save me. Where are you, God? Those times like that when I struggle, I find myself calling out like these men. Jesus, Master, have pity on me. I wonder if the other nine were tracked down after they had returned home. And we would ask them, why did you not go back and thank Jesus for what he did? One might say, I wanted to make sure the cure was real. I wanted to make sure that it would last. It was not just a temporary thing. And I got so consumed with my day-to-day activities, I just, I just plainly forgot. Another might say, I was going to thank Jesus later. Again, overwhelmed with daily things. Yet another might say, I never really had leprosy. That was a wrong diagnosis. I was diagnosed wrong, but because that's what they said, I felt that I had that, so I needed to, to go away. There could be an endless amount of excuses for these men, why they didn't thank Jesus. And I hope and pray that we are not like that. Let's not make excuses. Let's own up to what we have done, because it's not God's fault for the sad times in our lives. The bad times in our lives, I don't know if it is God's fault. Is it our own fault? Did we put ourselves in that situation? Maybe we did. I can't say for I can't speak for you, but I can't speak for myself. But such is human nature. Thanklessness and ingratitude is such a horrible sin. Paul says in Romans that an ungrateful heart is fertile soil for all kinds of sin. Read Romans chapter one, verse twenty one. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here it mentions that these people, they knew God, 
but they didn't glorify him, nor gave God thank, nor gave thanks to God. So we as believers, we know God. We know God is working in our lives, maybe not all the time, but he is. So are we glorifying God for the things that he's doing in our lives every day? Are we giving thanks to God for everything, even the bad things? Now, this is one thing that I really struggle with. When I first read that we are to give thanks to God even for the difficult times, how can we do that? If I'm going through a difficult situation. How can I say thank you, God, for putting me in this? I don't know about you, but I really, really struggle with that. How am I supposed to give thanks to God if I'm suffering? What good can come of this? But you know what? There is good that will come out of it. <clears throat> During the time that we were in our struggles, our low times in our lives, it may seem like there's no way out. How can we carry on? How will we ever get out of this? But even the bad times are part of God's plan. Now, there may be different reasons for God to put you in your situation than it's, than it would be in mine. That may be, I don't know for sure. But we are called to rejoice even during the difficult times. I know it's hard, but we are called to do that. But then again, if we think back of the difficult times that we had, we can see God working in our lives. We can see what he was doing. But again, at the time when we were struggling, we didn't realize that God was working. But Like I said, God is always working in our lives. Even when we don't see it, he is there. But let's give thanks to God for even the hard times in our lives. I know it's hard to do, but let's find it in our hearts to do so. The Spirit will empower us. God will empower us. Let's give thanks. So, is this a parable? Excuse me. So Jesus rewards the Samaritan leper with salvation. And he says literally, <clears throat> your faith has saved you. Ten, made, ten men made physically whole, but only one made spiritually whole. Nine still have a leprous heart, but one has a clean heart forgiven by Christ. Is this a parable of us today? There are a lot of people today who want to use God for his blessings. They might say, give me a spouse, give me a good job, give me food, give me a good grade, or give me riches. There are a lot of give me's and very few, if any, forgive me's. That's the sad part of the world we live in. It's all about me. Especially in the last week or so, we see this happening all around us. All about me. I heard one gentleman say to me once, it's me, myself, and I. Now, if we're all honest, that's quite selfish. Me, myself, and I. I don't hear God in there. Where does God fit in there? Is there no room for God? Are our hearts so consumed with ourselves that we don't leave room for anything else? All me, 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 me shouldn't be that way. And I think deep down we all know it. It should not be me. It should be more about others. As Christians, we are called to love one another, not just love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourselves, it says. It doesn't just say, just love me. Love everyone. We can get so consumed by ourselves that... We don't leave room for anyone else, not even God. Let's think about others and not just ourselves. And and that's the primary concern here for God, that our leprous heart be cleansed. His desire is for us to fall at his feet, confess our sin, and receive him as Lord and Savior. And if you have already led him into your heart as Lord, when is the last time you truly thanked him? Confessed, Lord, it's not just me, it's you as well. I want to give thanks to you. 
I want to glorify you for everything that you're doing. I'm not doing this out of my own power or my own will. Lord, you give me everything that I need to live, to carry on, the strength to get up in the morning, the will to go to work. God has blessed you with a job. Let's do it to the best of our abilities. He has blessed you with children. He has blessed you to be a mom, a father. Let's do that to the best of our abilities and call on God to strengthen us when we feel that we don't have it. Let God be God and you be you. Leave room for God in your life, in your heart. It's not me. It's not just me. So let's not keep long accounts with him. Long accounts is keeping our sin to ourselves. And don't be fooled. God knows that you have sinned. But we try to keep it ourselves thinking, you know, you know what? That wasn't that bad. It's, it, can't, it can't be a sin. God won't. God won't recognize that or he won't see it. Let's not fool, fool ourselves. He does. So keeping long accounts is keeping your sin to yourself, thinking that it might just vanish, it might just disappear. But it won't until we fall at the feet of Jesus and ask him for forgiveness. So again, it's not about me. Fall at his feet daily and confess. And let's not just make it a small little thing. You know what, God, forgive me, I, I did this today. I think we need to do a little bit more than that. We need to discuss it at a little bit more in-depth level. Confess it a little bit more in-depth. You know what, God, today I confess I, I treated my neighbor wrongly. Lord, I ask for forgiveness for that. I sinned. Cleanse my heart of that sin. Yes, God knows what you did, but I think it's more important or maybe even more special to him if it comes directly from your lips because he longs to have a relationship with you. He longs for that closeness. He longs for you to con- come to him and confide in him. So let's not keep long accounts. Let's talk with God every day of our lives. You may have a certain time set, a day, set aside in your day where you do this, and that's great whether it's in the beginning of the day, you set aside a little bit of time to meet with God, talk to Him, pray to Him, praise Him, or maybe at the end of the day, whatever the case may be, just take that time, talk with Him, have that relationship with Him. Let's not leave that until we have a bit of time after everything else is done. As it says in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So here we get a clear picture of how we are to confess our sins. It says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. So if we keep our sin, does that not mean that we will not live a good life? not sure. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I, I won't go into that too deeply. Maybe that's a whole nother, a whole nother uh, topic on its own. But then it says, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So here again, we see God is asking us to come to him. He wants to give us mercy. He has mercy on us. But he needs us to confess and renounce sins, then we will find mercy. God is merciful. A lot of times when I think about God like that, that he wants us to come to him, he wants me to come to him and confess. I don't know, I I get this wrong picture of God in my mind that he's this giant, overpowering master that just wants to come down on me so hard for the bad things I've done. But that's not the case. God loves me. God loves all of us. He wants us to come to him, and it says, as it says there, he will have mercy on us. He's a merciful God. 
He wants to forgive us. He doesn't want anyone to go astray. He wants us all to come to him and find that mercy that comes only through Jesus Christ. There's no other that has that power to forgive as he does. And so, in closing, I want to just encourage us all in this time of uncertainty as believers to stand on the promises of God. As it says in Isaiah 41, verse 10, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So here again we see how God has mercy on us. He will carry us through difficult times. It says, do not fear. We should not fear the circumstances we are in. It says, for I am with you. Again, here it says, God is with us. We are never alone. We may feel lonely, may feel that there is nothing else there, but God is with us. It goes on to say, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, it says. So God will give us strength. Let's draw from God's strength and not rely solely on our own. God will strengthen us. And it says, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How powerful is that? It's amazing. He will hold us up with his righteous right hand. He will help us in our times of need. Again, I just want to encourage all of us to draw our strength from God during this time. As we feel lonely, we're confided, confined to our homes. So let's just go to God, ask him for strength, for wisdom, for guidance, and for whatever else you may need at this time or at any time in your life, not just here today, but any time. So again, I encourage you to do all of that. I just want to take some time now to pray as I close. May God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have made. Lord, we thank you for your word. As you speak to us through your word, Lord, we confess it's not always too easy to understand what you are trying to say to us. But Father, we pray for wisdom and understanding in that area. I pray, Father, that you would be with each and every one as they struggle on different levels. Lord, you know where everyone is at in their life. May you help them through difficult times. May you just carry them through this valley. Father, we pray for your guidance, your mercy, and your love, Father, as we are coping with various things. Father, just help us in this area. Father, we pray that we would continue to rely on you and not on ourselves. Yes, we have to do our part as well, but Lord, we pray that you would guide us through the circumstances. And Father, we just rely on you. We love you. We know you care for us. Father, just help us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Henry, for that very timely message for all of us. It's interesting how so many thousands of years ago, people uh, struggling with various illnesses, and in our story today, leprosy specifically, and how they were put in isolation, and uh, and uh, we can understand how they felt, and many of you are experiencing that today. So good message, uh, good reminder for us to be thankful, not only for the everyday blessings, but thankful for salvation, and thankful that for forgiveness and what Jesus has done for us. So let us daily fall at his feet and just be thankful for what Jesus has done. And so for the benediction, I would like to read Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17, which also I think just fits so perfectly uh, with the message we heard this morning. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful 
Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God the Father through him. Amen. So may we go forward, and whatever we do, in word or deed, in isolation, uh, in work, in quarantine, no matter what, and uh, may we glorify God, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, and may we be unified in spirit and encourage one another in this way. God bless you. Have a great day.